Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's Dan and Matt here with you for the 61st episode of Fireside Chat, and we're coming off a great week of Flames hockey. We say that every week, but this week's been an amazing week as far as the Flames look on the ice. How you feeling, Matt? Pumped up. That was a great comeback against New Jersey and Anaheim. Simply amazing hockey by the Calgary Flames. Well, let's break down the week game by game. So last Tuesday, the Flames hosted the Ducks, and that was Peter Mar night. I wasn't at the Dome. You were there. What was it like to be at the Dome for Peter Mar night? It, the fans were able to give Peter a very good send-off, and it was nice to see. The first two periods were kind of blah, and like there was no energy in the Dome, but as soon as we got into the third period and we scored the opening goal everybody started to think, hey, we could actually come back and do this, and the fans just went off afterwards. It was one of the best games that the Flames have played in years. I like that the Flames were able to come back so late in the game. I mean, you don't want to see them down by two, but the fact that they were able to get three quick goals in the last 20, I mean, you take wins how you can get them, especially against a team like the Ducks, and it was a fun game to watch as a Flames fan, that kind of comeback. Yeah, and having the team show the resiliency that they did was amazing. And then to do it a couple nights later was even better. For it sure. just it, What can you say about these guys? They just have no off switch at all. It doesn't matter what the score is, they'll just keep coming at you. And that's what you want to see from this team. I watched the Peter Marr uh, speech on the website... I was touched by it watching on the website. I can't imagine what it was like to be there. Um, and I also saw that the Flames unveiled the new Peter Marr broadcast booth, which now sits next to the Ed Whalen broadcast booth. So both of our broadcast legends here in town have now been honored. You and I talked about Peter Marr perhaps becoming a member of the Forever Flame program. Do you think that the montage that he got is enough? Uh, it's one of those that... I can understand why they didn't like keep the Forever Aflame for players only, but if you were ever going to make an exception to that, Peter Marr was the guy for that. Like He literally called every game from 1980 forward. Like, <laughs> what more can, you know... It, uh. Well, you know, and I don't want to disparage Ed Whalen at all, because he's another fantastic broadcaster and a Calgary icon, but... He's not a Hall of Famer. Peter Marr made it to the Hall of Fame, and I think when you have a Hall of Famer, no matter if it's a player or a coach or a broadcaster, they deserve some special recognition. Exactly. So, to me, I thought it's a, it's a nice tribute. I like that we're going to see Peter's name every time we get there, but it seemed to me like it wasn't enough. It seems like that's great, but there should still have been a forever a flame banner or you know something else to recognize Peter as a Hall of Famer. I think it needs to go a little bit above and beyond what Ed Whalen has for that reason. Exactly. That's it. It's like they did the minimum that they could have done for him, and that's where I think they could have gone a little bit further. Not even necessarily a forever a flame, but something more. Yeah. No, I I agree. I think that the for, I think the forever flame thing is silly the way it's being used. Anyways, we've talked about this in the past. I think those jersey numbers should just be retired. Um, but Peter Marr would be a great guy to be in that spot and have his face in the rafters forever. So if they're gonna do that program, I think Peter lends himself well to it. Mm-hmm. But it just it didn't seem like enough to me. I think that's a. Uh... You know, we're both on the same page there. It it's just it was nice to see him get his honors though. And then just for the sake of completeness, um, he did also get a new trophy named after him, which is the Peter Mar. I think the Peter Gar Peter Mar Nice Guy Award, which is awarded to a member of the Flames media each year. Okay. So uh, an interesting piece there, but you know, not something the fans are going to be seeing. That's more of an award for his colleagues, which is a great thing. But 
not the kind of honor I think fans are going to remember. Nobody's going to know if Eric Francis or DeHatchik or anyone like that is the nice guy award winner. Nor are the fans probably going to, you know, really care if they do know. Exactly. But I was glad that the Flames were able to come out and, as Peter would have said, put one in the win column. Um, especially against the Ducks. I think it was a very fitting win on a very fitting night. Yeah, and it was nice to see Hiller do his celebratory hops after the game. That was fantastic. He reminded me of that guy a couple of years ago, Henry Carlson, who used to do the karate chop after the shootouts. Mm-hmm. That was... <laughs> I was laughing in the stands when he did that, so... That and, was good. And, you know, that's what I love to see. I love to see raw motion from players. I mean, you could tell that that win against his old team meant something to him, and I love that. Just let it all hang out. I agree. Two nights later, against the Blackhawks, the Flames fell 4-3, to three, which, you know, there's no shame in losing the Blackhawks by one goal. Well, other than when they were... In the first five minutes when they went down to nothing. After that point, they were pretty much on par with Chicago for the remainder of the night. Like, occasionally, they'd get... The Hawks would get control on our end, and we'd run around a bit. But we also took it to them for most of the game. And that, to me, even though we lost, that was a very encouraging sign that, okay, yeah, you're the one of the top teams in the league. Who cares? We're still going to come after you. Well, that's it. I think when I was watching that game, what was going through my head is the fact the Flames can play on even a level close to the Blackhawks in a year that were, on paper, not a very good team is really impressive to see. It, yeah, and if they can play this way against all the top teams, even if they don't win the majority of the games, the fact that they're pushing on them and making them have to work for it, that's a good thing. It, even if like the Flames don't make the playoffs this year, at least they're getting good lessons on how to actually beat these teams. Yeah, the Flames this year are becoming known for their work ethic. If you listen to what other teams are saying about them, what other players are saying about them, Everyone's saying that the Flames are a hard team to work against. And I think we have a great example of that in that Chicago game. If there's ever an example this year of that, I think the Chicago game is the one. And to contrast between the reaction of the Flames and the Oilers, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, after the Blackhawks thumped the Oilers 7-1, to he said that it's impossible to come back from 3 nothing down in this league. Like, that kind of attitude is the reason why the Oilers are an embarrassment to the NHL. <laughs> you gotta get and, your Oiler digs in, don't you, Matt? Well, it's embarrassing. And, like, you, even if it is difficult and doesn't happen very often, you still have to have the attitude of, we're going to come and we're going to try and beat you. As we've seen with Calgary the last week, we've come down from two goals plus several times to, like, I think they went down two goals three times against New Jersey, and uh, yet they still managed to get four out of the six points, despite trailing. And that work ethic by Calgary, and not carrying that oh we're losing is a major difference why the flames are where they're at in the rebuild where the oilers are still an embarrassment and have been for the last decade well and we've talked about this before i mean these guys have all bought into the hartley system and i think it'll be interesting going forward for the flames they start to bring new players in here not so much rookies who are being trained this way but veterans coming in to see how guys are going to be able to fit in, and if there's anyone that's not going to be able to fit into this work ethic the Flames have. Like, I think there's a handful of guys around the league I can name off the top of my head that you know would not be willing to put in the effort and the work. Mm -hmm. Oh, and here's an interesting statistic. Uh, Jay Bollmeister, he sat out the St. Louis Blues last game, and his Iron Man streak ended. Now, the current leader in the Iron Man was a former Edmonton Oilers draft pick who made his NHL debut after the last time the Oilers made the playoffs, Andrew Cogliano. 
So he's the current <laughs> leader in consecutive games played, and he's played only in games after the Oilers last made the playoffs. Wow. I just I just thought that was kind of funny and sad at the same time. Speaking of defensemen, the first two games this week um, against the Ducks and the Blackhawks, it was nice to see Dennis Weidman contributing offensively. He had three goals in those two games, and I was not expecting him to get two goals against the Ducks. And the one against the Blackhawks on the uh, power play, I thought that was quite a nice goal. And Johnny Goudreau was on the ice. Marcus Granlin both assisted that. But it it was quite nice to see um, a little bit of an offensive streak from Weidman. Well, he's been rather streaky this season. He, the first handful of games, he didn't get any points at all. And then, then they he went on a tear. Yeah, then he went on a tear, and then he started to slide again. And then the last couple of games, he had a few goals and was rather dangerous. Just odd to see someone go from like being supremely awesome to nothing, and then back to being awesome again. And then the third game this week, the Calgary Flames took on the New Jersey Devils. And interesting there, I thought their second goal being scored by Mike Camilleri was uh, quite fitting against the Flames. Yeah, and his traditional on-one-knee right off yep. the goalie's side. Yep, you knew, it, you knew it was coming as soon as you saw him put the puck in the net. You knew this celebration was going to be his traditional thing. Oh, yeah. And he had a good game. He uh, did. And I was actually impressed that the Flames didn't boo him that much. <laughs> so, Yeah, well, you know, I think that it's not like he left here uh, um, wanting to get out. I mean, he was a free agent. He had the right to leave. It's not like we traded him. I think there's some respect there as well with him leaving. Mm-hmm. And realistically, I wouldn't have wanted the Flames to sign him for $5 million a year for five years anyway, so... No, I would have been okay with the money. I wouldn't have been okay with the term on that contract. Exactly. That was a an interesting game for the Flames. Uh, Curtis Glencross got two goals. Michael Furland got an assist on Josh Juris' power play goal. That's his first assist of the year. Nice to see Furland back. And we also saw the debut of, or the season debut of yet another Flames prospect when Corbin Knight suited up wearing number 10. Didn't see a lot of Knight, but what would you think from what you saw of him? Well, he was recalled because the Flames have struggled mightily in the face-off circle with having three of their four centers being injured at the moment. And he came in and won 67% of his face-offs. That's what he's here for. He did a great job. I have no problem with what he did. He is likely going to be more or less a fourth-line guy moving forward that's a good face-off specialist. And if he can contribute more than that, that would be good. But he got a good opportunity in the shootout and unfortunately wasn't able to convert on that. Even when we brought Knight in a couple seasons ago, I think it was you that first mentioned, this kid is a good face-off guy, and that's why he was being brought in. And I think it's taken him a bit longer to make it to the NHL roster here than I think we'd like it to. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he sticks around. He's not definitely the strongest of the players that we've called up, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's the first guy sent back to Adirondack. But he did He did lead the Flames in face-off win percentage. He got 6-7%. Monahan had 54%. Granlin, 42%. Juris won 65%. And uh, Hoodler won 0 So it's nice when you can get called up because you play a certain role and already in your first game lead the team in that role. Like you said, he was called up to win face-offs, and that's what he was able to do. And it it's a good experience for him as well, and it... It's a reward for his stellar play of late in Adirondack. Yeah, and the Flames have said that they're going to be, you know, rewarding players that play well down there. So I think, I don't think this call-up had to happen, but I think it was happening as them kind of keeping their word and saying, yeah, we promised this would happen, here you go, because we scratched a healthy uh, Brian Bolig in order to get him into the lineup. Mm -hmm. So good to see that management is keeping their word on that. So great week. Um, the, we had a we had some questions last week going into this week of if the Flames can actually play with the big boys in the NHL, if they can run with the big dogs and keep up. And I think after this week, 
the questions in my mind anyways have gone away that yes if the flames can you know win against the ducks lose to the hawks by one goal and show such a comeback in both games this team can probably hold their ground against any team in the NHL right now what do you think i agree wholeheartedly i was hoping that they would at least not get embarrassed like it's sort of like that early game against st louis where we just sucked <laughs> entirely against them and the fact that they were able to push back and beat the ducks and then push back and tie the blackhawks before losing it late that's encouraging and they still have a lot of games coming up against similar teams they play the ducks again this week they play the sharks a few times in the next couple weeks so when we start seeing more games against these good teams, that'll be even more of an indication if this team is really as good as they've been to this point. It's also interesting to note that with the Flames having 28 points already, that in the last like 25, 30 years, only like five teams uh that are at this point in the standings uh have actually gone on to miss the playoffs so hopefully they've banked enough points early that they can actually weather the storm to go and at least get the eighth seed well and that's the interesting thing too with the flames having such a good start to this season um you know if they do run into a rough patch somewhere down the road it gives them kind of some points that they can rely on, some points that they can fall back on and slide a little bit up and down in the standings. So nice to have those and, you know, be ready to go. When when you get hit by those injuries or by that tough streak, say, hey, we've got these points, we can go forward not having to worry about needing that win really badly, perhaps, and make them more into learning games. Well... Last season, the Flames had 77 points in 82 games, which if you're basing the remaining 60 games the Flames have to play this season, that getting almost a point a game, that would put us at 88 points, which would be only a couple points out of a playoff spot. So if they can just play even like five or six points better than their pace from last season over the next 60 games, then it, they should be able to actually lock down a playoff spot. Something that if you would have said to me before the season, I would have thought you were stoned. <laughs> well, I mean, if when we had our conversations in August and September, if we would have looked at even where the Flames are right now, of being fifth in the West at the end of November... I would think that you were crazy. I thought, okay, maybe they'll go on a bit of a hot streak at some point, but I didn't think they would look this good. No. Like, if they, you would have said, oh, we would have been in the top few seeds in the end of October, I would have even believed you there because we got off to such a good start last year that maybe we just caught teams unprepared again, but we're closing in on the end of November and we're still in the top five so uh, you know it's surprising and it's a good thing and it's been great to see that the flames have been able to keep that energy up i mean they started the season with not so great a start we lost to uh the canucks four to two we beat the oilers as we expected then we lost a big game to the blues and then you know we started to pick up our momentum from there and it just kept building and building and building without any sign of slowing down anytime soon and the, the thing that I'm liking is that the Flames aren't just relying on, say, Goudreau being awesome. Like, they're getting excellent play from Monaghan, from Juris, from Granlund. Furland was amazing in the game against the Devils. So, you know, it's encouraging to see. And I'm hoping that with the Flames having so many different contributors that they'll... Even if one group isn't on their game, the other group will be, and they'll get consistent offensive threats that way. Well, if you look at the roster, when I you know look down this roster, I don't think there's anyone on this team this year that I can say has not had a good season or has not helped contribute. Every man on this roster is helping in their own way, and we're seeing, I think, some of the best career years for a lot of these guys, like Lance Boma, 
Paul Byron, guys you're not expecting to contribute who really are helping. Even if it's not putting pucks in the net, they're playing hard offensively. They're moving the puck forward. Like, there's nobody on this team where you look at and go, we need to move this guy out of town now. No, exactly. Like, there's no Blake Como-type guys where, like, oh, he really sucks. Even well, guys like Devin Setaguchi are yeah. holding their own. Yeah, he's just not contributing much. No, so. but he he doesn't look terrible when he hits the ice. No, he's just your prototypical standard fourth line guy, sort of like Mark Smith from like seven, eight years ago. There's a name I forgot about. Yeah, just uh, he can do the job. He's not going to get you any points really or do much, but he's not going to embarrass himself out there. Yeah, no, that's true. So it's been a great week for Flames Hockey. Uh, interesting note, there's been 22 games played, which means 44 possible points for the Flames so far. We've taken 28 of them. So our record at this point is 13-7-2. and two. Quite a good record for the Flames. It's nice to be on the upper, upper side of a 500 season. Yeah, and coincidentally, the Flames have exactly twice as many points as Edmonton. <laughs> There you go. Edmonton is 14th in the West, which is absolute last place, and they are right now tied with Columbus and Buffalo for the honor of having 14 points. Yeah. Awesome job, Edmonton. Never change. <laughs> well, I don't know. They can't have all of the best players every year. Well, honestly, if I'm McDavid, Eichel, or Hannafin, I'm like, if you draft me, Edmonton, I'm demanding a trade. <laughs> Pull a Lindros? Exactly. Because, wow. That's... Yeah. You never there know. are no words. <laughs> you never know. We'll find out. So I was doing some research today, um, looking at this team and this season so far, and interesting stat that I came across... So far with the Flames, as we know, they've had a lot of injury troubles. They've lost 73 regular season man games to injury. That's almost an entire season. Having as many players out for a month as we have, I think Backlund, Colborne, Stajan, and uh, Mason Raymond have all been out for a month now. Uh, the games start to pile up, but... It's unfortunate that the Flames have run into that many injuries. You never like to see guys get hurt for an extended period. But thankfully, the Flames have so much depth on the farm that they've been able to absorb those injuries and keep on rolling. Well, if you look around the league, there's very few teams that would have that kind of depth, that could have the same caliber. I mean... You know, you might say some of these guys aren't first liners, but in relation, they are our first line or second line players. There's very few teams that could lose as many, you know, one, two, three, four, five of their top nine forwards and still be in the position the Flames are in. Oh, I agree. And ha having unexpected seasons from both Grandland and Juris has helped to alleviate a lot of the normal concerns that you would have losing as many forwards as we have and having both Juris and Granlin getting I think five and three goals thus far has been very impressive considering their lack of experience and you know I, I know it's bad to say this because we never want to see a guy injured but at the beginning of the year I was wondering how the Flames were going to be able to shuffle some of these farm players in you know, you looked at the roster, we had a solid roster, we didn't have a lot of extra spots, and I think for some of these players, these injuries have been good for them because it's let them come up and take a spot that they probably wouldn't have had or play here for as long as they have. So as much as you never want to say it's good to see anyone injured, I think it's been a blessing in disguise for the organization. True, and that's all part of the rebuilding process. Like, injuries do happen. Like, even the least injured teams usually lose about 200 man games over the course of a season. So, the fact that that uh, we've had such good response from the guys that we're recalling, ha to me, has been the more shocking and impressive thing. Yeah, it has. Well, let's do a quick recap of where the injured players are at so everyone knows. Uh, Mason Raymond 
was put on the IR on October 27th. He's estimated to be out for 12 games, so he's right now listed week to week, so he could be coming back in the next couple weeks here. Um, but he's anticipated to be back in the lineup before Christmas. Well, he is skating. He and Colborn, they're yeah. both back skating, at he, least. Yeah, they're skating. They haven't got full clearance, but they're expected to be back in a week or so. Yeah. Matt Stajan is still out. He's still anticipated to be about six games away from being back from his knee injury, which is, you know, tough for him because that's a long time to be out. He was out for a long time last year, too. And being one of the veteran players in this team... I wouldn't be, you know, I honestly would not be surprised if he might be one of the guys who loses his spot when he comes back. Yeah, and I know he just signed that contract extension at this summer for four more years. I don't know if it might not be uh, poor form or not, but I think with the play of both Joris and Granlin that maybe you look to trade Stajan when he gets back. Yeah, I got. I have mixed feelings on that. I mean, we've seen good seasons from Granlin and Juris so far, but they're also not having proved themselves long term as guys that can hold that spot. For all we know, it's you know a flash in the pan. It doesn't look like it, but it could just be a flash in the pan that we don't repeat. So it's probably not a bad idea to have some conversations around Stajan. But I think if nothing else, he's a guy that's shown he can play at the NHL level. And until those other guys are able to prove that for longer than, you know, 15 games, I think you keep him on the roster. Even if he's sitting in the press box, I think he's got to stay on the roster for right now. Yeah. Maybe in February, come the deadline, you look at moving him. But I think, you know, when he's back, well, it'll be, by the time he's back, it'll be almost January. So, yeah, it might be about the time to move him. I just don't know what you're going to be able to get for a guy who's been out for a big chunk of this year and last year. Yeah, well, the thing is is that a lot of teams do need help in the center position. Like, uh, speaking of Edmonton, (laughs) you know, they could definitely use a center-like stage in to help solidify their center ice position because that's one of their main areas of weakness. So, if you were going to trade him, I don't think you would have much of a difficulty in doing so, even if you're not getting a lot back for him. And, you know, we could trade him from a position of power as well. You've mentioned, and I've talked about with you, the possibility of moving Curtis Glencross this year. If you can call up a team and say, hey, we've got not only Glencross, but Stajan available, you might be able to work quite an interesting deal there. Mm-hmm. Especially if we absorb some salary. Exactly, and the fact is that we have Monaghan and Backlund, right, as our de facto one-two centers, but we also have Grandlin, Juris, Bennett, uh, Jankowski, and a bunch of other guys that are coming through the organization as well, in addition to our already established guys. So it's one of those things that, y- you know, you have to make room eventually and is that this season? Is it next year? Well, I, I wouldn't keep staging around just because he's a veteran. I think that, you know, he's, as as of right now, I'd probably say he has lost his spot. I think we have young players playing well enough to have taken that spot, but I think it's only fair when he comes back to give him some ice time and see if he can win his spot back, and I think that determines if he stays or goes. Yeah, and, like, I could even see shifting Granlin to the wing in a case like that to uh, allow Stajan to get that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just don't think it's fair to say, well, you were out, someone took your spot, so see you later. I think you have to go to him and say, okay, oh, no. you've been out, we're going to give you you know, four games, five games, go out there and tear it up. Yeah, definitely. And even if he does tear it up, we can still move him, but then you're also dealing from a position of power of saying, hey, look at this guy who's on a hot streak, you want him. Exactly. The other injuries on the team we have, Joe Colborn is still out. He's listed day-to-day. He's skating. And from what I've been seeing, he could be back as early as the first part of December. People aren't expecting him to be back next week, nor do the Flames need him right now since they're carrying extra players. But it's better safe than sorry from what I've been reading, and he could be back the first week of December. The other player who's out still for a while is Michael Backlund. Backlund was put on the IR October 11th, and he's still week-to-week, but he's not on the ice. Is that correct, Matt? 
Yeah, he's resting his abdominal muscles still, and I do believe he's going to probably be out till around Christmas time between rehabbing once it, the injury goes away and then getting back on the ice. Sort of like what Colborn and Raymond have gone through, because they've both been skating for about a week and a half now, two weeks. And like we were talking about earlier with the depth, it's nice that we don't have to rush these guys back. We can let them heal properly. We don't have to say, okay, get back out there. We need you. Let's go. Hurry up. And that's sometimes how you re-aggravate injuries later in the season. Yeah, especially an injury like Backlund's where it's a muscle fatigue type injury. You can re-aggravate that easily. You have to wait until you're back at 100% before you can go forward. I think if you look at this list of guys that are injured right now, Raymond, Stage, and Colborne, Backlund, I think especially a guy like Michael Backlund, who the Flames probably see as a key player here for a long time, you want to make sure you're taking care of him because you don't want that same injury cropping up year after year after year. Yeah, exactly. And especially with Backlund, like he would be a good second, third line center on a contending team so like if he can get back and be a hundred percent down the road that would be a lot better than having chronic issues for sure and the last guy on the injury reserve no surprise is david jones and he's listed day to day but according to the news uh this morning november 24th as we as we record this he's pretty much ready to come back in the lineup so i think david jones is a guy that's going to be on and off this list all year yeah i just wish that he could stay healthy for a bit like he has performed well when he's in the lineup it's just i don't know how long you can go having a guy that's only going to play about one out of every two games and you know i think again he's helping some of the young players get a spot and i wouldn't be surprised if he loses his lineup spot because of that if it's okay david we can't rely on you to be healthy so we're going to sit you out for a while or maybe even you know try to wave him and send him down um because i think that we do have players who are more healthy that they'd rather carry up here yeah and like even if they did put him on waivers nobody would take him at four million a season so if they wanted to go that route to get him some ice time in Adirondack, that might be a possibility. Especially if he's getting hurt a lot, they might want to send And I think you can actually send him down for so long on a conditioning stint without him going through waivers. That might be something they can look at as well. Yeah. Well, Matt, we've looked a lot this season and talked a lot about some of the young faces that the Flames have brought in through call-ups. Guys like Furland, Granlund, Juris, all these players, Backland, the Flames have brought up in the forward ranks. And it's kind of interesting if you look at it. The forwards have been going down uh, with injury, but none of the defensemen have been hurt. And I think, you know, the fans now have a good look at the future of the Flames up front. But I thought, why don't we spend some time looking at if there is injury trouble this year in the defensive ranks, who fans might expect to see recalled from Adirondack? Well, the, there's one guy that's, like, forefront on the defensive recall list, and we saw him a bit last year, and that's Tyler Watherspoon. He is definitely rounding into form on Adirondack's team. He's the first pairing defenseman there, and... He's a very solid two-way defenseman. Yeah, he is. And like you said, we saw him last year a bit. He got hurt near the end. He's looking good, and I would not be surprised if he was the first guy that gets called up by the Flames. Um, he's 21, but he, to me, when I look at him play, he doesn't look like a 21-year-old. He looks like a guy who's older. Every time I, I remind myself he's 21, it's like, wow, I'm. he just plays like he's 23 or 24. Yeah, and that consistency in his game is actually somewhat surprising for someone so young like i don't recall him making that many glaring mistakes in adirondack of the games that we've watched well and, and the fact that he's the first pairing defenseman tells you he's not i mean there's a lot of defensemen there that they can move up and down yeah and he's just been very steady and i don't know if he has the offense in his game to be a top pairing defenseman but he definitely could slide in as a number three four guy Watherspoon is 21 years old as we mentioned he was a 57th overall pick by the flames in 2011 stands at six foot two and right now he's weighing in at 210 pounds so 
as the Flames have shown a tendency for a bigger kid, which is always a good thing, um, especially if you are calling up a player to have him a little bit bigger if you can. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to thank Tim Erickson for demanding a trade, netting us both Grandland and Waterspoon. So, you know, when you when you think <laughs> about that trade, that's a good point. But when you think about that trade and you think about what Erickson has done since then, I think we definitely got the better side of the deal. I w- I was surprised at the time what the return for Erickson was, but I think as far as the rebuild, that's one trade you might be able to trace back and say that was a key part of this rebuild. Well, the thing is that. Both Watherspoon and Granlund have individually been better than Tim Erickson since the trade. Never mind the fact that we also got Roman Horak, who was a key part of the Smead deal as yeah. well. So that was probably Jay Feaster's best trade. It was. And like I said, I think you could look back and say it was a key trade to set up where we are now as well. Mm-hmm. So some other guys that are playing in Adirondack, uh, let's talk about them. One of the newest faces is uh, Sina Akolatsi, who came over from the um, Sharks organization. What do you think of what we've seen from him so far? He's a solid physical defenseman. I, I don't see enough upside offensively, but he's definitely will get in your face and be a pain in the ass out there. Yeah, no, you're right. He looks good at the AHL level. I think he's probably destined to be an AHL regular for most of his career. I think especially with some of the guys in the lineup above him, he's not going to get called up to Calgary this year. No, it, he is one of those guys that might get a call up here and there, sort of like Yonkman has, and he'll play all right, but he's replaceable. So speaking of Yonkman, um, we have Yonkman and Potter in the farm right now. Do you think that if the Flames get into trouble on the blue line, they call up Potter first or Watherspoon first? Uh, it depends on which guy gets hurt. If it's a more offensive guy like uh, Russell or Brody or Giordano, then I could see Potter coming in. If it's one of the more defensive guys, then I could see Watherspoon. Yeah, no, I think I think you're probably right on both those. And Yonkman is not actually signed by the Flames, so he can't be uh, brought up unless they sign him to a contract. He's on an AHL deal with Adirondack. Yeah. Um, some more defensemen down there. Ryan Culkin. What do you think of what we've seen from him? You think he sees Flaming Sea jersey this year? No, he's too young. Uh, he has been good offensively in the games that he's played in. It's just he's really young and he's in his first pro season so you don't want to see guys get rushed no i think he would be out of his element at the nhl game level and i think that right now the ahl is the perfect place to keep him there's no reason to bring him up we've got lots of guys above him in the depth chart and i think that he's right where he belongs for right now yeah, the only way that he sees NHL ice this season is if, like, five of our defensemen get hurt. <laughs> but, you know, even in that case, I wouldn't be surprised if Yonkman got signed before Kalkin would see the ice. Yeah, and you might even see a guy like Kundari get called up as well instead. So let's go there. I think unless, you know, extraordinary circumstances happen, that's probably another guy we can both agree is not getting a call up is Mark Kundari. Well... He was really bad at the beginning of the year. And since about the last two to three weeks, he's turned his game around quite a bit and has really settled down and is not making as many mistakes as he was in the beginning part of the year. Both of us commented like how disappointed we were in his play and he's really settled his game down and has been one of the leaders for Adirondack lately. So it's one of those things that if he can remain like he is now, I could see him getting a recall possibly. I think if we're looking at this from a rebuild perspective too, he's 24. The Flames, the only reason I could see them bringing him up maybe after the deadline is see what they've got there because he is 24. I think now is the time when you decide if this is a guy you want to keep in the fold as potentially that, you know, eighth defenseman who jumps up and down or if it's time to cut your losses move on with Kandari. I don't think I'd bring him in when we need a, a defenseman before the deadline, but I could see him getting some play after the deadline for that reason. 
Yeah, same here. And it's the same thing story with Ben Hanowski as well. I could see both of those players getting a recall late in the season to see whether or not you offer them a contract again. I think their contracts are up at the end of the year, so... Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, I think the same thing that we said for Culkin probably applies to Kulak for both of us. I think that he's too green to be called up. Well, he's in Colorado right now, and uh, I think the WHL team that has Kulak's rights is trying to trade him to a contending team, and if that happens, then uh, I could see the Flames sending him back to the WHL. Sort of like what they did with Furland. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I've I've watched a little bit of Colorado stuff, not a whole game, but I've seen some clips of him on uh, online. He looks really green still. Yeah. And he was really good at the beginning part of the season, but yeah, he kind he and Culkin seem to have gone in opposite directions from the beginning of the season cuz Culkin wasn't very good at the beginning of the year. Now he's doing well. Kulak was good, now not so much. So the next two defensemen on the list, uh, both of them I could see getting called up in, I think, that Watherspoon and Potter are first, but these are the guys I could see as more kind of long shot guys. John Ramage and Patrick Seeloff. Let's start with Ramage. What do you think of what we've seen from him so far? you think he wears a flaming C this year? I doubt it. Uh, he's good, but it's sort of like the same story as Senna Akalatsi where... He's a good AHL guy. I don't know if he has that extra gear to become an NHL guy. It's... You have to wait and see. And he too, I do believe, is in his either his first or second year as an AHL guy. And usually defensemen take two or three seasons to figure out their game. So we'll see. See, the advantage I think he has is he's a Flames draft pick. So I can see them wanting to bring him up almost to kind of, you know, see how the homegrown talent's doing and kind of say, okay, this is one of the guys we want for the future and stress test him at the NHL level. Mm -hmm. I could see that. And the last guy, a guy that I hoped was going to make the team last year, I thought might this year, and that's Patrick Seelov. Um, I'm liking what we've seen from him so far on the whole in Adirondack. What do you think about Seeloff? He's definitely shown a willingness to hit people, and he's done a good job, and I have no complaints. He's on pace for to be an NHL player. He's still green, and like a lot of our... Well, he's also prospects. missed a season. Yeah, and... It, he is likely not going to be in the NHL for another year or two, but he will be an NHL player. So if you were to rank the top three of those defensemen, you think the Flames would call up. Who do you think, if uh, if Treliving needs a defenseman, he calls for? Uh, one, two uh, would be interchangeable. I'd go with Watherspoon and Potter, depending on which guy gets hurt. And then after that, seal off. Yeah, no, I'm the same with you. I think uh, Watherspoon and Potter definitely come up first. And like you said, depends who gets hurt. And then if Seeloff keeps playing the way that he's playing right now, I think that he's definitely the next guy on that list. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about the Adirondack Flames, um, they have a really impressive eight-game win streak right now. Can you believe for a team that came out as crappy as they did at the beginning of the season that they're on an eight-game win streak? Well, the thing is, is that they were getting really substandard goaltending from both goalies, and their defense was abysmal at the beginning of the year. And once uh, Potter got healthy and Watherspoon got healthy, the team's defense really settled down, and they've been on fire ever since. And even with their eight-game winning streak... They only lost one, and then I think they had won two or three of the previous games before that. So they've been quite hot for a while. Yeah, and it, it's really nice to see that even without their top forwards, this team keeps finding a way to win. Yeah, and they're getting offensive contributions from all over the place. Like, even David Wolf has stepped up and scored a couple of goals. So it, it's good. It's fun hockey to watch. If anyone hasn't watched AHL, Matt and I both invested in the AHL online subscription. I think it's called AHL Live this year. 
one of the best investments I made in entertainment in a long time. It's good hockey to watch. It's fun. Oh, yeah. And you get to see the next wave of Flames players come up. And seeing guys like Poirier work their magic down there is fun. And I think it's like 100 bucks a year, so it probably costs the same as the last DVD season box set of your favorite show that you bought. Mm-hmm. And even if you buy in now, you can actually go back and watch all the old games. So if you're ever sitting around on a Friday or Saturday, which I know I am sometimes, going, I really want hockey on. Sometimes I have it on the background while I'm working. Sometimes I just want to sit down and watch a game. You can actually go back and watch all the old games from this year. Yeah, it's definitely been a fun team to watch. Like, even in the games that they were losing early in the year, they weren't getting completely shelled, even if they were losing, like, 5 or 6-1. It's just they weren't getting the right bounces, this, that, the next thing, and... And the goaltending wasn't in their favor either. Yeah, like, some of the goals that Ordeo gave up early in the year were, like, facepalm worthy, but he's definitely turned his game around. If you look at some of the team leaders on Adirondack this year, we're getting a lot of contribution from guys that we wouldn't have expected to. I mean, I wasn't expecting that they would ever be without this many top players down there, but the leader in goals, for example, is Ben Hanowski right now with seven goals. Ryan Culkin has the most assists with seven goals. Hanowski leads the team in ten goals. Um, Bill Arnold and Nolan Yonkman both have 18 games played. Garnet Hathaway, of all people, leads him in power play goals, which I wouldn't have expected. Well, he's basically just been parking right out in front of the net. Yeah, he has. Allowing other people to shoot at the net, and he just, like, it plays the Thomas Holmstrom role of just banging the, that puck in. Yeah, he does. But, I mean, you know, he, with all the players they have, I wouldn't have expected him to be one of those guys on any leaderboard. So it's good to see that he's stepping up and doing what he can, and... Well, he did have an impressive training camp, and he did get the AHL contract, so we'll see. it. He could be another guy like Juris that comes out of nowhere and becomes an NHL player. Wouldn't that be nice if our program can be a factory for those kind of guys? Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> um, Corbin Knight leads the team with shorthanded goals with one. Not a big achievement there. Corey Potter is the plus-minus leader with plus six. Dustin Stevenson has 32 penalty minutes and leads there. Um, interesting on the goalie front that I think Brad Thyssen has seen more action than I expect him to so far. What about you? Well, that's a more an indication of how poorly Ordeo was in the beginning part of the season, that they just started throwing Thiessen in there just to like hope to get somewhat yeah, decent no, you goaltending. Yeah, you could be right there. <laughs> and T. Sinashi leads in goals against average with 2.05, uh, 93.3% save percentage. Though Ordeo does have more wins. He's got eight wins so far. Yeah, well, Ordeo, like, his goals against average was over four yeah, up until I know. just recently. I know, so, and it's going to take him a while to get that back down. Yeah, as a and that average. was... Like, it, the first couple of games, like I think he let in, like, 11 goals in the first two games. So, anytime you have that kind of poor performance right off the bat, that'll impact you for a while. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes I know I don't give goalies credit enough for how many minutes they actually play. But looking at the stats today, Yoni Ordeo has played 733 minutes so far. And, I mean, you know, we all know the goalies out there for so long, but it's when you see numbers like that that you really realize how long these guys are actually on the ice. Yeah. Well, over the eight-game winning streak, I do believe Ordeo's goals against average has been 1.8. So he has been a lot better of late. It's just his early poor play that's gonna scar his stats for a bit and that's something the flames have got to figure out i mean he was bad at the beginning of last season he's bad at the beginning of this season you can't have a guy who's projected to be your next great goaltender who doesn't get started till mid-november no and like you could excuse a guy like aginla for starting off late because there's still 19 other players type of thing but it's difficult when it's your goalie and he's giving up five or six goals that you're going how did you let that go in yeah it's funny you brought up again like because that's where i was gonna go is this guy's like jerome again and leg pads 
We'll see. I don't know what his problem is. Like, is it an off-ice training issue in the summer or something? Because the last couple of years, when he's started the year, it's just been abysmal. And, you know, it's weird because he looks okay in training camp. Like, this year in training camp, he didn't look awful. He came into camp, he looked okay, and then he goes down to the AHL, and he doesn't look great. So... You'd think if it was an off-ice training thing, you'd see that in his preseason performance. Yeah. I don't know. They'll have to work on that with him because especially now next season, he has a one-way contract, so he'll be getting paid the same amount if he's in the NHL or AHL. And you can't have a backup goaltender being that poor because then you're forced to play Jonas Hiller like every game and you're getting into the same situation that Kipper had the only thing and I've been trying to figure out what could be wrong with audio for a while the only thing I can potentially think of is that last year he had a new coaching staff as he kind of moved into Abbotsford full-time and this year they've got a whole new coaching staff so I wonder if it's him having trouble adjusting to new goalie coaches and new systems and that sort of thing I think it'll be interesting to see next year with pretty much the same head coach I imagine in position same goalie coach how things are going to work there yeah oh and uh speaking of uh coaching Ryan Huska has done a fantastic job settling down and making adjustments to how the Flames are playing in Adirondack. He, uh, when he was in the WHL, his uh, team was actually a defense factory. So I think that's part of the reasons why the Flames got him, because of the fact that Calgary's defensive pool is not as stellar as the forwards, that maybe he can manufacture something out of the defensemen that we already have and you know if you look at at both of our coaches huska and hartley we have two coaches that really have kind of come out of nowhere if you will and produced these great teams this year and you got you got to give them both credit i mean i don't know how long huska's contract is but if he was in a contract year like hartley there's no doubt you re-sign him i'm glad i'm glad he's here and i i like troy ward but seeing how Huska comes in now, I think he's definitely the better guy. I'm glad that Trilliving let Ward go. Yeah, I agree. And the Flames in Adirondack, they're playing the exact same manner that Hartley's got the Calgary Flames playing, where it's just relentless. Well, that's one thing they've talked about for a few years, is having the same system between the two. It's not just the system play, it's that they're they keep going and I think that's part of the reason why they've won eight in a row is that they're just catching other teams off guard by like how relentless they're playing yeah no you could be right and it's it's building that idea of what a Calgary flame is between the two rosters Mm -hmm. and that's good for the rebuild because even if you plug in like the next wave of young players coming through If they can learn that way, then we'll have qualified replacements once contracts and all that get in the way on the pro team. The only downside to having such a great HL coach is you hope he doesn't get sniped. I mean, we've had Playfair, we've had Troy Ward, we've had our share of good HL coaches over the years, and you just hope that Huska doesn't get sniped by some other rebuilding team. True. True. I want to see him here working with the Flames for a while. Because even when you and I went to the rookie camp in the summer, I mean, he was the first guy on the ice working one-on-one with players. He was the last guy off the ice working one-on-one with players. He seems like he's the right fit for this development team. He's got that passion for developing these guys. Maybe a Hartley replacement down the road. Who knows? Could be. I don't know. I'd almost, I think once you get out of the rebuild, I think he would be better suited as I said with Troy Ward when we had this discussion when they were looking for a coach for Hartley, I think that he's better suited in the development system. Mm-hmm. I think that there's other coaches I would want moving forward after Hartley's tenure to bring this team into the playoffs and the Western Finals and the Stanley Cup. And I think you need to keep some of those good coaches saying, you know what, you're a great development coach. Stay doing what you do best. Yeah. We'll see. Still a long way to go (laughs) between now and then. 
Well, Matt, before we wrap here, uh, anything else you want to bring up this week? Nah, I'm good. We should probably mention the passings this week in the hockey community of Pat Quinn and Victor Tikhanov. Both uh, very respected hockey men. Um, I was surprised to hear Pat Quinn passed away. He's always a coach that I've respected. And for people that don't know, he was actually a member of the Calgary Flames family. He played in Atlanta for about five years. Yeah, it's disappointing to whenever a hockey legend passes on and to have two go on the same day. It's never a good day. And... You know, my condolences to both the Canucks and Maple Leafs organizations, as well as to the Russian national team for their losses. And yeah, and I can honestly say I'm not as familiar with Tikhanov's body of work, but I've always been a fan of Pat Quinn. I thought he was for a long time one of the best development coaches out there. Yeah, and there's not much you can say. It's it always sucks when a community loses someone important and Quinn definitely was for both Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah. Our on fireside chat sympathies go out to both the Quinn and the Tikhanov families, the teams they affected. There's a lot of players that played for both those guys. And you know this is gonna be felt throughout the league probably all season. Definitely. Well let's look at next week. Uh Flames have three games on tap. They play the Ducks again. They've got a back-to-back with the Sharks, and then the Coyotes come to town. What do you six points on the table? How do you think we're gonna do? Well, last week we were kind of hesitating and saying, well, if they get more than two points, that'll be a good week. And I think it's the same boat this week. Uh, both the Ducks and the Sharks are gonna be brutal games, especially Anaheim. That to me is the biggest test, uh, probably of the season. Because of the fact that we've sucked in Anaheim basically since Anaheim became an NHL team. So, (laughs) you know, if the Flames can actually manage to win there and break the cycle, like, I don't think they've won since January 2004. So, that to me, if they can win there, then I think this team actually, I can start seeing them actually making a push for the playoffs not just a team that got off to a hot start i had the pleasure of going to a a game in anaheim last year i was traveling there for work and i i thought the flames were going to do well and i knew the curse and i got there and they started playing well in the first and you just see the game falling apart and you're like no you can't do this like it's it's just a building like any other what is so cursed about the building in anaheim yeah, yeah, I don't know what it is. Like, hopefully now that we've stolen Anaheim's goaltender, maybe we can actually put that curse to bed. Who knows? Well, see, that's the thing. is when I saw after the game last week that we beat the Ducks and I saw that they're coming up again exactly one week from when we played them last, I thought, I think we can do it once. I'm not convinced we can beat them twice in a week. Well, they... When they played Anaheim earlier in the week, they had a hard time adapting to how Anaheim plays. But when they made the adjustments heading into the third period, it's like they, the light bulb went on. So we'll see if they, those adjustments that they made can carry over again and they can beat them. I just hope they win a game in Anaheim just to hopefully put this stupid curse to bed. Like that, that'd be nice. Like it had been like something like five or six years prior to the last time that the Flames won in Anaheim. So like, uh, <laughs> you know, one win out of like fifteen or eighteen years or whatever, like that's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. I think the big test this week is not so much going to be the Ducks, because like you said, they might be able to solve the Ducks. I think it's going to be the Sharks. We haven't had a lot of um, back-to-back so far, and the Sharks are a tough team, and I'll be curious to see how a lot of these young players do in a back-to-back game where they're probably going to be exhausted after game one. It's not like we have an easy team and a hard team. I think it's going to be a real test for some of these young guys to come out and play the Sharks the night after they've got the Ducks. Well, the Sharks have been a really strange team this year, so we'll see. They've been kind of up and down themselves. 
So it depends on what San Jose Shark team we're facing. Like, if we're getting the crappy version, then we might walk away with the two points. If we're getting the good version, then it'll be a tough one. Either way, the Sharks are and have for a number of years been a very physical team. And I think more so than a lot of the teams the Flames have played this year, the Sharks mirror the Flames, I wouldn't say work ethic, but their kind of sandpaper-like qualities in that way. So I think it's good that we have the Sharks second because I think we might get banged up in that game. Hopefully we're not going to see somebody else in the IR. Yeah, and then we play the Coyotes twice in a row, which is kind of weird. Well, it's, it's, it's not, weird because we get a two-day typical... break, we play the Coyotes, then we get another two-day break, and we play the Coyotes again. Yeah. They actually play the the Edmonton Oilers in between our games, so it's not like they're coming straight here. So they get an easy game, and then they get to play us again. <laughs> there you go. Let them win another game in the middle. Yeah. Do you think that we'll beat the Coyotes? Of the three, I think that's the one I'm most confident over, just because of our work ethic. I think we can take them. With I the... don't know if we win both, but I think we'll probably skate away with the first one anyway. With the two-day break before the Coyotes, I think the Flames will be ready to go again. I think a lot of it's going to depend on which of the two games. Um, I think they're going to win one in California. I think it depends which of the two. I think if they win against the Ducks, lose against the Sharks, they might lose some momentum going into the Coyotes game. But if they lose the Ducks, win to the Sharks, I think some of that momentum will carry over. So I'm predicting four possible six points this week. Bold. I'm only saying two. With two? Hopefully more. <laughs> I'm taking a risk after last week, Matt. Yeah. We lowballed it last week, and the Flames did very well. Yeah. Well, I'm always of the opinion that if you have set the bar low, then you're not disappointed if they only meet your threshold. <laughs> That's what we did with this whole team this year, right? We thought they were going to suck, and look at where they're at now. Yep. They've done a very good job of setting that bar low. I'm not saying, oh, we're going to get four or six all year. So that way, if they actually manage, <laughs> then hey, that's awesome. <laughs> that'd be nice, wouldn't it? If they, especially if they can keep up that kind of pace. If you can do like four of every six, that'd be amazing. Yeah. And hopefully they can keep on a roll. Like, they haven't slowed down at all, even though, like, the young players that have come in and been hot, like, they're keeping up their stellar play. So it'll be interesting to see if they can keep it up. I haven't talked to any of the Flames, but I wonder how much of that is motivating the other guys. If it's, look at these kids coming in with all this jump and energy, we got to play to their level, or we're going to lose spots. And I wonder if that's really driven some of this team not slowing down yeah well hey it at least we're getting some encouraging signs for our rebuild moving forward like we're not just lying down and getting kicked (laughs) sort of like a a team up north it's been another great week to be a flames fan and hopefully we'll still feel that way after this coming week yeah and congrats to the calgary stampeders for thumping the edmonton eskimos I don't watch football, but hey, anytime you can beat Edmonton, it's a good game. <laughs> a lot of good things going on in sports in this city right now. Yep. Well, Matt, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, have a good one, everyone, and thanks for listening. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.